So we are looking at um, choosing who to marry. You know, usually there are there are two issues you will be confronted with when you want to marry. The first issue is just even having somebody who wants to marry you or someone you want to marry. And the next issue is how do I really decide in the final analysis? How do I decide between A and B? And um, as simple as that may sound, okay, maybe I should sit down. <clears throat> so as simple as that may sound, um, it's probably the most important decision you will make after your salvation on earth. You can make or mar your life. Marrying wrong can destroy you. At times I wonder, when I hear the way people present marriage, <laughs> I'm like, it's like these people don't know what people are facing in marriage. I've heard people say that, you know, there was a video that went viral where the pastor was beating men. Go and marry, go and marry, go and marry. And um, I've heard people say, well, the reason why many people are not married is because they are looking for a perfect person. That uh, once somebody is a Christian, just go and marry. <laughs> Uh, they don't understand. They don't understand. Anyway, what I intend to do, or what I see Lord doing with us today is to show us a principle in his word, in a story that is completely unrelated to marriage. And yet, we find something about marriage there. So, like I said, two issues. How do you find somebody to marry? And how do you eventually decide? As a sister, you have three brothers saying they want to marry you. It's even more difficult for the brother. You know, a woman's choice is limited to the brothers that comes to her. A man's choice is limited by all the women, marriageable women in the world. You can basically marry anybody. You can go to Jamaica and marry as a man. You can just decide I want to go to Spain to marry. And you'll find somebody there who will marry you. So yeah. it makes the decision complicated for a man or for the man rather. So it makes the decision extremely uh, complicated. But the Bible says that the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. Anyway, uh, let's look at that making, making that choice. Let's look at that. The other aspect, you see that one, um, I believe that it is God's duty, that other one. It is God's duty to lead somebody to you, to direct men to you, to order your step aright, uh, to open your eyes to see someone. I believe is first of all something that God orders. So I won't be dwelling on that today, except if in the course of discussion, um, our thought goes to that direction. So let's look at Acts chapter 1. Let's pick our reading from Acts chapter 1. And um, we will read from verse 20. Verse 20 to 26. That's where our focus will be. Verse 20 to 26. Now, the background to this is the story of the apostles. Uh, Judas had died because uh, he betrayed Jesus. You know all the story. But having 12 
apostles is something God ordained. So it's not a matter of Judas is gone, let the eleven continue. They have to be twelve. And the reason they have to be twelve is well, one of the reasons. When you look at the book of Revelation and the new Jerusalem, the new house of God is being revealed, the twelve disciples, they have their name, I think, as the foundation of that new city. And then the, the 12 tribe of Israel at the gate of that city. You and I are the city. So they occupy a strategic role in the eternal scheme of God. They have to be 12. They were chosen to be 12. So if, if one person is missing, somebody must occupy that slot. So it's a slot. God has created that 12 slot and somebody must definitely fill that slot. So that's what they are now trying to do. And we want to use that to show God's principles for making choice. Now, verse, from verse 20. So we are now looking at principles for choosing. So from verse 20 it says, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishop break, let another take. That's Peter. Huh? That's Peter quoting from the book of Psalms. And as you probably notice, I always emphasize the apostles still relied on scriptures. Peter didn't rely on the fact that he can hear from God. He's relying on scriptures. He still had to go and look for scriptures that fit that occasion. So what is the first principle we are seeing here? The first principle in making a choice is that you must understand what the Bible teaches about marriage. If you don't understand that, then you will run into problem. My people perish for lack of knowledge. All these... Uh, uh, what is it called? Excitement. That somebody says, uh, oh yeah, I see wedding invitation card. Lift up your wedding. You know, people, people just want to marry without understanding what exactly marriage is. You know, I don't understand why people, they just want to get married without understanding what is it about marriage they are not interested somebody um a lady asked me some time ago she says sir um how do i know who to marry i said um it's not something i can just tell you by heart that um and i said okay the best i can do for you is that is either i send you videos to watch or you take our free marriage course. She said, no, 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 I don't have time for that. Just tell me now. I said, I'm sorry, I cannot tell you. She said, all right. <laughs> Somebody else came to me and asked me, sir, you said um, God has revealed in his word the kind of person we should marry. I said, yes. She said, tell me those verses. I said, well, it's not something I can just tell you. It's something you have to sit down to study or to be taught. She said she doesn't have time for that. Um, I don't beg people. The Bible says, let him that is righteous, let him be righteous still. They go your own. I've, I've done my own part, you know. So, um, the first thing you see here is that Peter needed scriptures. What did God what is the purpose of marriage? You can only understand that from scriptures. Why should you get married? You can only understand that from scriptures. Now, we are looking at how to choose. And what are we looking at? Scriptures. So, the, that, that's, that's always very important. See, if marriage is starting on account of somebody says, <laughs> somebody says, this is my wife. Somebody says, this is my husband. Ah. Uh, that is um, um, that is a great error. That is a great error. 
Uh, let me see if this thing is set. Uh, It's a great error. Uh, so it's always important to have scriptural basis for marriage. There are many mistakes you won't make by just knowing scriptures. So many mistakes. Um, last week, you know, a lady came to me. She said that, um, sir, there is a brother... She is so caring, he's so nice, he wants to marry her, but uh, he's a non-believer. I now asked her, I said, are you born again? She said, um, she said, yes. I said, no, you are not born again. She said, sir, I'm born again. I said, if you are born again, I don't expect, what kind of born again is that? I don't expect you to be born again and be telling me you are considering somebody who is a non-believer. You don't need counsel. You don't need me to tell you that uh, this relationship is not right. The, the Bible has already spoken about that. You don't need anybody. It's like somebody asking me, sir, I'm being tempted to fornicate. I don't know what to do. What's the will of God? You don't need me to tell you the will of God. The Bible is expressly clear. Except something is wrong with you. And you know this thing, the devil will push them until they enter into that marriage. You know, people underestimate these days. What I'm realizing is that the deception of Satan is so wicked, people underestimate Satan. People don't understand what the devil is trying to do. The devil will raise a wicked man to become caring and come to you. And the man will become nice. And you'll be like, ah, you, know, you know me. Uh, this, is the, this is the church I know. The man will say, oh, no problem. I can even be following you to your church. And that man is not pretending. No. He himself too We feel that way. But when you enter that marriage, that's when the devil will press the right button. Suddenly this man says, no, you must follow. What do you mean? You must do what I do. And the lady will be like, we didn't say it like this. And he has to comply. You know? So, it is very important that you look at scriptures. Anybody who is prophesying that you will get married and is not teaching you scripture, that person is not helping you. That person is wicked. That person does not want you to go very far in life. Now, that's the first thing we noticed. Let's look at the next thing. He said, Wherefore, that's verse 21, of these men which have come accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went out, went in and out amongst us. Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out amongst us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us. Must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection? Do you know the second principle here? The person you will marry is somebody that had been with Jesus. Do you know how many of them were here? They were 120. Verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. They were all disciples. And said, the number of names together were about 120. That means that they were about 120 disciples. Now they want to appoint only one. They are now saying that, see, the person that we will appoint must be somebody that, since that time when John was baptizing and Jesus went there to be baptized, till now, it must be from that kind of person. So somebody who joined 
in the third year of Christ will not fit in into this criteria. Do you see that they have limited their search? They have limited the number of people they have to pray about. A lot of people have widened their own scope. Once you've, you've included unbelievers, um, churchgoers, sinners, all ca- you've, so you've extended your search. So you will have so many people to pray about. You will be confused. They narrow it down to people who had been with Jesus. Have no beast. See, uh, you see, you, you know something about life. Whatever decision you make, you are the one that will enjoy it or suffer as a result of it. So it's your choice. Don't marry somebody who doesn't know Jesus. And when I say know Jesus, I'm not talking about somebody who say I've confessed Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Don't marry somebody that you cannot see the mark of Christ on him or her. Somebody who has spent time with Christ. If they tell you that, uh, well, you know, there are women who have entered into bad marriage because they told them that, well, you see, there are no good men. No, you will just marry one and keep managing. That's how some people ended up marrying a boxer that is kicking them left, right, center because they told them that uh, they should marry. And I tell people, I say, see, there are a lot of people enjoying their marriage. There are people marrying rights. They say, no, all women are wayward. In fact, you'll be surprised that more women are marrying as virgins than women who are ma- marrying as non-virgins. So, m- don't, you know, even in leadership, one of the criteria, God said, a novice must not be appointed into leadership. A novice. Who is a novice? It said a novice must not be appointed into leadership. You know, you know who a novice is? A novice should not be appointed into leadership. That's somebody who just gave his life to Christ. Or somebody who had been in Christ and, and is not growing. Somebody who has been in Christ and the person is not growing. That's a novice. Don't marry a novice. Don't marry somebody that does not bear the mark of Christ. I'm not saying uh, somebody that goes to church. I'm not saying somebody that goes to night VG. Today, we have a lot of people who are involved in church activities who don't know the Lord. They may appear good now. <laughs> when the time comes, when everybody's faith will be tested, that's when you will know that you have made a wrong, a wrong decision. They said somebody who had been with the Lord, beginning from the baptism of John, unto that same day, look at, look at their criteria, unto that same day that he was taken up from us, Till the last day of Jesus. You, have, you must have been from beginning to the last day. They couldn't risk somebody who joined in the middle. <laughs> you couldn't risk it. A brother comes to you and says he wants to marry you. This is uh, 2022, July. In the course of your interaction, this brother still fornicated October 2021. And he's already telling you, he's now telling you that he wants to marry you now. Please don't consider it. He has not spent time. He has not spent time to experience purity. And be very, see, be very careful of people who cannot spend time out of relationship. There are people that from the day they started doing boyfriend, girlfriend, till today, they've always been in a relationship. Once he's out of, he or she is out of a relationship, in another six months, he has spoken to another girl. In fact, some, as early as one month, he's, he's already talking to another girl. You have to be very, if, what that means is that that person has a problem. He cannot, he or she can't live without a relationship. He or she needs a relationship as a sustainer. That is not right. Avoid people like that. 
You see, if you, if, if you were in a relationship and you realize this relationship is wrong and it's not right, the right thing to do is, after you have made that mistake and you quit, spend some time. And I always share my own experience with people that at the point where I thought I was going to, when we have had informal introduction and we were preparing for a formal introduction in December, and then um, by August the relationship was over. It took me nine years to be married after that. It took, and God specifically said to me, you don't know anything about marriage. Sit down, let me teach you. Many people can't wait. They always want to be in a relationship. They are, and they convince themselves like, you know, we need to be growing together. You know, we need to understand each other. The problem is that they have never learned how to stay with. And see, you can't hear God when your emotions are already activated. It's always good to even leave this issue of relationship for some time. And let God work on your life and give you clarity of, about your life, give you clarity of what he wants to do with your life. So, always look out for people that you can see genuine Christianity in their life. Don't compromise on that. If you won't find one, it's better you don't marry. It is better. Today, a lot of people don't know the Lord. People are just doing church, doing so many activities, running up and down, doing ministry. When you even listen to what they are teaching today, you can, you can know that in, in many churches today, it's difficult to marry somebody from many of, many of our churches. Except God is working privately in the life of those people. I ask myself, if from January to December, all they are telling you is six key to financial transformation, you can't be a good spouse. How are you going to be a good spouse? You don't know anything about marriage. You don't know anything. And you know something? The key, look at what they said. They said somebody who had been, who had been with them since the time Jesus was with them. So they know that the most critical thing is being with Jesus. Can you see? They are not saying somebody from my tribe. I know so. I, oh God. You know, I, human beings, we are, I can understand why God has problem with us. We are so complicated. A lady I knew some years ago, the mother told this lady that she must not marry anybody from Kogi State. And then the mother died. And then she claimed to be born again. And the brother that approached her happened to be from Kogi State. It was the only basis she said no was that before her mother died, her mother said she should not marry anyone from Kogi State. It has nothing to do with Jesus. It has nothing to do with what has the Lord said to you personally. And she, and she didn't marry that brother. I know another lady that even felt she regretted her marriage today. Because one of her own mistakes, and these are people who profess Jesus is that the mother said also, I don't even know why it's also Kogi, don't marry somebody from Kogi. And she had good Christian brothers from Kogi, she said no to them, and went and married one church goer from another state. Now she's drinking pepper soup. She's facing it in marriage. For this disciple, the critical thing in appointment is, has this person been with Jesus? So you see the deception today. People want to hear about marriage, but they don't want to hear about Jesus. <laughs> you know, one time I did a video, Becoming Like Christ. I put it on YouTube. 
Then I did other video, Getting Marriage Right. Getting Marriage Right has so many views. Becoming like Jesus was struggling to have views. Now that's foolishness. Because what they don't know is this. It is the knowledge of Christ that guarantees marriage. You can't marry right if you don't know Jesus right. In fact, I would rather go and learn about how to become Jesus than to watch getting marriage right. But that's what is happening today. So people want to attend marriage conferences. But nobody wants to attend discipleship. What then do you want to go and do in that marriage? All the attitude, the behavior, the character that you need to function in marriage is developed as you know Jesus. A man is as good to the degree to which he knows Jesus. If he doesn't know Jesus, he's, he's worthless. A woman is as good, not to the extent to which she can cook, have sex, lay the bed, clean the house, but the extent to which she knows Jesus. A woman cannot submit the way God says we should submit if she doesn't know Jesus. Neither can a man ever love like Christ that he does not know. How can you love like Christ when you don't know that Christ? It's not possible. So, you see two issues so far. Number one, they started their search from scriptures. On the basis of scriptures. Many people have been misled today because they are attending churches that they believe in prayer. They don't believe in scriptures. You know, human beings, we just have tendencies not to be balanced. To just move here. Can you please hold this? It will affect recording. Sorry. They, there are churches today that they will not teach you, you will have any teaching from scriptures about marriage. They are just praying for you to be married. So people go and attend prayer at 7 a.m. because they want to be married. 7 a.m. 6 a.m. You are joining somebody online. When that is your own morning, when you should, you should spend time personally with the Lord, you go and join. So, you know people who do that, they don't want you to grow. How can, how can you be spending your morning to go and meet another man somewhere to pray? When do you now develop your own time with the Lord? And the reason why you go there is because something is saying to you, your prayer will be answered there. That is on Christian, it's on scriptural. Our prayer, your prayer will never be answered because you went to one man. Your prayer is answered based on the teachings of Jesus. It's very clear. He said we have this confidence that when we ask and we ask according to his will, he hears us. He says when you pray, believe that you have received it and you will have it. Abide in me. Let my word abide in you. You will ask anything and it will be granted to you. It has nothing to do. The concept we are practicing today, where somebody is starting a prayer meeting and you are going there to think your prayer will be answered, is actually idolatry. When we gather to pray together, you know why we pray together? One of the reasons we pray together as believers is that we can enforce the things of the kingdom with our agreement, with one accord. Did you ever see anywhere in the scriptures where Peter, Paul, gave impression that if you come to them, your prayer will be answered? Did you ever see anything like that? Did you ever see them praying for people? Today, men of God give you this impression. They will even tell you that if you don't pay money, they will not cover you. They will not provide you with covering. Please put your hand here while we read 2 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 25. And if you see it, please read it for us. No, no. 2, is it? 3, okay. Let me see whether it's 1 Thessalonians. Uh, yes, uh, First Thessalonians five 
25. Can somebody please read it? Pray also for us, brothers and sisters. Please, who is, who is saying that? As for who is Paul saying you should pray for them? The church. Where last did you hear a man of God saying you should pray for them? They give you impression that they are the one that should pray for you. You just read it in the Bible. Paul said, brethren, pray for us. That's a man of God. That's a man that understands Christianity. The Christianity we are doing that is giving you the impression that your prayer will be answered when you go to camp is unscriptural. That when you go to Shiloh, your prayer will be answered there. It's unscriptural. Prayer is not answered on a geographical location. It is answered in Christ. You don't need anybody for God to hear you. You are not a bastard. You are as equal as a son as anybody. When we come together, it is to pray for kingdom issues. It is not so that my prayer that I'm praying in my room that God did not hear, he will not hear it here. It's unscriptural. We are doing so many things that are not Bible. This is not the only place Paul said pray for us. So if you read Ephesians chapter 6 again, he said pray for us that God will give me a time. Paul always requests for prayers. When did you see a man requesting for prayer? They can't because they have given you the impression that they are the one praying for you. So you wake up in the morning because you want to be married. You go and join a man at 7 a.m. He, he, they print your prayer request and put it in front of them. They say they are praying for your prayer request. It's idolatry. It's not Christianity. And I'm not saying this because I want to discredit anybody. I'm saying it because it is simply the truth of the scriptures. They have no basis of scripture here. So they are saying, uh, you are going to get married. To what? What do you know about marriage? Anybody that is praying for you to be married and is not teaching you how to marry, that person, is, that person wants to kill you. They checked, has this person been with Jesus? To the extent to which you know Jesus is to, the ex to that extent you will enjoy your marriage. It's as simple as that. In fact, to the extent to which I'm growing to become like Christ is to that extent my wife will enjoy me. The things that are causing fight in some marriage will not cause fight in our marriage, not because we are special, but because we will deal with issues the way Christ will deal with it. They, see, they slapped Jesus, he didn't react. They owe Jesus, the word of God, Look at what Jesus said about himself in the book of Revelation. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. He said, I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the first and the last. Yeah, that same man. They held his hand and somebody slapped him and he didn't say anything. Then you, you are now saying your wife insults you. You are now angry. Why should you be angry? Why should you fight your wife? When they did worse to Jesus and he didn't react. So a man who has seen Jesus. So when we talk about seeing Jesus, we are not talking of Jesus appearing to you. We are talking of you with the inner eye beholding the glory of Christ so that you become like him. A man who has seen Jesus like that, there is nothing the wife does. That man will not react. That man will overlook it. Because he has seen Jesus. Don't joke with it. Don't let them tell you you are old school. I'm not interested in all these brothers that are wearing sneakers and so on, but they know nothing about Jesus. All these brothers that speak empty grammar and useless philosophy, but they know nothing about Jesus. I'm not you, you can't impress me. I'm not, I'm not impressed by you going to spend uh, 24 hours to plate your hair or to wear one wig and say it's Brazilian or Argentinian braid. I'm not impressed by all of that. How much of Jesus do you know? The Bible says, let him that boast, boast in this, that they know me. Can you boast that you know him? That's the kind of person to marry you. Don't joke with it. Don't say, well, where will you find that kind of a person? You become that person. And leave God to find that person for you. Become that kind of a person. Spend time knowing Jesus. He said, see, knowing Jesus is a lifetime journey. It's a beautiful experience. Knowing Jesus will resolve a lot of issues for you. It will narrow your search. If that is the criteria you are also looking for, 
it will narrow that search. So you have very few people to check as a brother. Because you are not going to find too many people that meet this second criteria. You are not going to find it. So it, it, it makes your job easier. I beg you in the name of God, don't marry somebody that doesn't know Jesus. I'm not saying somebody who say I'm born again. Somebody that you can look at their life and see the fruit of Jesus. You see, what you should check in a woman is not the size of her breast. It's the size of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in her. But what you are checking is her bum bum. What you are checking is her breast. Her color. What does color profit any? What, what will her color do to you? Oh, she must be yo, 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 yo. She must be ebony, ebony, ebony. What does that do? You need to visit mortuary occasionally and see what our color is. <laughs> you, that's when you will know how useless the color is. Can you see Christ? I'm not interested in you packing your breast and all over my face. All I see is breast. I can't see Christ. All I'm just seeing is breast, breast, breast. It doesn't impress. What should impress you as a brother is a breastplate of righteousness. It's not our breast, but our breastplate of righteousness. That's what will impress you. Today we live in a world of vanity. Absolute vanity. <laughs> so, you have to ask yourself, has this person been with Jesus? Do you know that even for the disciples, when they told them not to preach again, they said, they noticed that they are unlearned men, but they had been with Jesus. If you had been with Jesus, we will see it. A man, let me tell you this. A man who has seen Jesus, his life will be about Jesus. You can't see Jesus and pursue anything else. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a man that want to be a, that, want, that is want to be a pierce. He want to buy peers. But when he saw a costly one, he sold everything he had to buy that one. When you see Jesus, you give up any, everything. You can't see Jesus and then you are discussing. You say, let's put Bible aside. Let's talk practical. You have not seen Jesus. You have not seen Jesus. When a man sees Jesus, he has no other message. That's why Paul said, I'm a born servant of Christ. It's not all these ministers that we see today that say they are, they are preaching Christ. They are not, nobody is preaching Christ. When did anybody preach Christ? When is it all about Jesus? If they preach Christ, the church will be like Christ. We are becoming what they are preaching. I can tell you what you are doing in your private life by just looking at you. Your behavior, your disposition in life. I can tell you what you are. I can tell you what you are reading. I can tell you how you are reading Bible by your behavior. It will show. You can't see Jesus and you won't have the mark of Christ. Paul said, I bear in my body the mark of Christ. When you see a man that has seen Jesus, there is nothing more. He's pursuing. He's Jesus. David said one thing that I desire. One thing, just one thing. That I might be in the house of God and behold his glory. That's a man who has seen Christ. Paul said one thing I do. Forgetting the things, anything, I don't count anything to be important. But that I might know him. That's a man of God. A man of God is not pursuing building 300,000 auditorium. What he was pursuing in ministry is that he personally will know the Lord. Not that he will win the whole world. Paul didn't say that I might win 5 million souls. You know, we have all kinds of foolishness today. Somebody says he's, he's pursuing 5 million souls because he has read a lot of books about goal setting. They don't know that the goal setting of the world has nothing to do with Christ. And Peter said he was going to win 3,000 souls the mo that morning when he woke up. Did he know he would win 3,000 souls? Two weeks later, did he know he was going to win 2,000 souls? Three weeks later, did he know he was going to be in the house of Cornelius? He never made daughter call. He was preaching. The Holy Ghost came upon them because the people had already believed. You don't need to come out to, to be saved. Raise your hand, close your eyes, come out. You don't need it. While you are seated, you can be saved. Peter had not made any altar call. He was just preaching. The Bible said, while he yet speak, the Holy Ghost came upon them. 
And the Holy Ghost will not come upon you if you had not believed. So in their hearts, they had believed. So you don't need to call people out. <laughs> oh, Lord of mercy. Has he or she been with Jesus? I don't want to take too long of your time. So let's move on. Now, in verse 23, they said, And they appointed two. See, their choice became very simple. Joseph called Basabas, who was surnamed Justus and Matthias. Why couldn't they appoint three, four? <laughs> Many people didn't meet that criteria. So they ended up with only two. If it was only one man, it would have been easy for them. But they ended up with two. Now the question now is this. Who among the two should they choose? Who should I marry? What should you really look into? Because let me tell you something. You will always have choice. You see, there are people today, there are women today that are single. It's not because they don't have somebody who wants to marry them. It's because they refuse to marry those people. They don't want to entangle themselves. They call it, isn't entanglement you call it today. They refuse to be in a wrong marriage. So they reduce it. But now, let's now look at the next thing they did. Verse 24. And they pray. Do you see where prayer now comes in? We have looked at the first thing they did was scriptures. See, let me, and you see, I, I really don't want to say this. But I don't know how best again I could say it. Uh, because you see, when you are preaching, you must not preach yourself. You must preach only Jesus. But this is what Jesus did with me. And I'm not lying. You see, I read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, searching for wisdom about marriage. I did it. And I was noting it. So many, I, I, I sat for all the principles of making choice. So I studied David, how he was appointed. I studied how God appointed 300 people for Gideon. I studied this story that I'm teaching today. And many other things. Why was I doing that? I knew that in myself, I'm a failure. Forget it. I don't have that wisdom. And you see, we, I pray God will give you long life. I pray you will, you will be married and you will look back. I've been around for a while now. So I have opportunity to look back. And I now look back at those that I said, maybe I could have married this. Maybe I should have married this. And now I'm giving thanks to God that I never married those people. But at that time, they didn't appear like that to me. Some of them appear like, oh, I know this sister in my fellowship. Wow, we look like couples made in heaven. <laughs> My dear brothers, in fact, it was after some years that I learned that the Christianity we did in fellowship is uh, elementary. Many people that are zealous in fellowship, many of them have gone to the world now because they have never faced the world. Somebody is feeding you, is clothing you. You don't yet know the pressure of having to look for money to pay for a family. Many brothers just went astray because they, now they had to look for money and they just, they just went off. Many sisters just missed it, mixed with friends, mixed with all kinds of people. That's the benefit of hindsight. And despite all that, I almost made a mistake. I almost, if not for mercy, which I'm going to end up with. So the Bible says, and they prayed. See, you will pray. But the person that will pray is the person that understands marriage from scriptures. He's the person that knows from the pool, the sample pool, to choose somebody you want to marry from. That's the person. Otherwise, imagine that they were praying without scriptures. Imagine that they were praying without limiting the choice. There are people you should not pray about. 
They didn't waste their time praying about 120 disciples. Oh Lord, among these 120, show us the one. Show us the one. <laughs> and I want to ask you something. Look at this elaborate process. Couldn't Jesus have simply appeared to Peter and said, Peter, go and appoint Justus in replacement of Judas. And Peter would say, Brethren, Jesus has appointed just Justus. Couldn't he do that? He can. But doesn't do it. He usually doesn't do it. Because he is not interested in you simply getting it right. He wants you to be part of the process so that you can know God. He wants to show you the way of God. He wants to teach you his way. And that is why he wants you to be part of that process. Otherwise, why were they going through all this problem? When the Holy Spirit could have simply said, at least Holy Spirit came to Peter and said, uh, no, sorry, an angel came to Cornelius and said, send for Peter. He mentioned Peter's name. Cornelius didn't know Peter. So the angel can come and simply say, go and marry this person. But you see, when it comes to issues that deal with our life, God doesn't work that way with us. He wants us to be part of that process. Even when they were searching for wife for Isaac, it was the same principle. I can show you that this same principle, the wife, the servant of Abraham, practiced everything. Everything. He started first with instruction from Abraham. He also limited the choice to let it be the woman that gives me drink. He limited the choice. So it's not every woman that comes to the well. He's the one that meets this criteria. He was not putting out a flea. He was looking for a particular, he was looking for Christ in a woman. That thing that that man said is Christ in a woman. That's what he was looking for. And then he prayed. So you will see the consistency of this principle in making choice. He prayed. Some people don't know how to pray. What many people are praying is God, give me a husband. Oh, Father, I'm a faithful titan. Oh, Lord, where's my husband? Give me a husband or I die. <laughs> you see, your prayer should be... Okay, I can't recommend prayer for you. I just want to give you an idea. Your prayer be, Lord, give me a home that will be a platform for Jesus. Now you are praying. You see, many of us, we don't know how to harass God. <laughs> you know what I mean by harassing God? Pray what God wants. Lord, you know the mother of Samuel, he knew, she knew how to harass God. He knew, she knew God needed a priest. These sons of Eli, they, these ones are not going anywhere. Lord, give me a child. I will raise that child for you. <laughs> God said, okay, that's a win-win. You will have a child. I will have a priest. God bless you. And she gave God that child. She has a child. You can't say she's bad. She has a child, but God has a prophet. That's how to pray to God. Don't see. That's why Jesus said, if you will come after me, you must deny yourself. Self must die. The, the prayer of the church in Nigeria is a self-based prayer. That's why we are ineffective. It's about self. Self must die. Lord, give me a woman that wants to serve you. Give me a woman that loves Jesus. Lord, teach me how to love my wife the way Jesus will love her. You are praying. That, that's, that's prayer. God is committed to those kind of prayer. I say, ah! When he hears that prayer, he says, um, put attention on that boy. Put attention. Go and give him what he wants. Go and give him what he wants. That, that, that's, you know, that's my boy there. Because you are seeking his glory even in marriage. You are not marrying for yourself. Oh, God. You know marriage is not for you. <laughs> you will always think marriage is for us. It's not for us. So. God was the one that had a business to do. And he created a man to do it and a woman to help him. So marriage is for God. Did he not say he created everything for his own pleasure? Including marriage. He didn't create it for you. So why are you restless? Why are you now feeling like if you don't marry, you don't have life? But be careful of marrying those kind of people that feels that if they are not married, they cannot have life. That's why some people who got married, when their spouse died, they never recovered. 
Some people always almost became mentally derailed because their spouse died. Because they are living on a man. They have not learned to live exclusively on God. So whether you are in marriage or you are not in a marriage, it should not matter. Some people are waiting to be married before they start living for God. You are planning. You know everything. You know in those days, my sister, I went to her one day. To, I was probably in secondary school. And I'm like, ah, you don't have uh, this. You don't have this. You, why is your house like this? Only spot to cook. I want small TV. I want to hear music. I want to, you know what she said to me? My sister said, don't worry. I'm going to my husband's house. So I now discovered that that's the mindset of a lot of women. They are planning to express themselves when they get to their husband's house. So my sister didn't see the need to have heavy speakers, to have good sound system. Because to her, I will soon go to a man's house. So what am I doing with all of this? Don't wait to be in a man's house to live for Jesus. I've seen sister, a lady told me some years ago, she said, I, I, you know, in those days, me too, I didn't know much. So I'm like, I said, you are, but you are not serious with God now. She said, eh, that's why you are there now. With you, we can together. <laughs> oh my God. Be careful of those kind of people that we, they are waiting for you. For them to get their life serious with God. So they prayed. Now, but let's look at what they prayed for. Thou Lord, which knowest the heart of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. <laughs> ah, do you understand that prayer? That prayer is heavy. To understand that prayer, can somebody read for us Jeremiah 17, verse 9 and 10? Jeremiah 17, verse 9 and 10. Read it with a beautiful voice. Jeremiah 17, verse 9 and 10. Who can understand the human heart? There is nothing else so deceitful. It is too sick to be healed. I, the Lord, search human minds and test human hearts. I treat each one according to the way he lives. According to what he does. Who can understand the heart of a man? King James says the heart of a man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Even God, he doesn't just know it. He needs to search. He said, I, God. The Bible says it came to pass that God tested Abraham to see what was in his heart. You, you are looking at face. You are looking at uh, he preaches in fellowship. Have you not seen pastor beheading people to put them under their church auditorium? <laughs> there is one reason why you can never choose right for yourself. That's the reason. The apostle knew that. There's no way you can marry right by yourself because there's something you don't know. That's the heart. You, how will you know it? As we are seated here, you don't know what is in our heart. People will sit there in church on Sunday and they will be lost in. They will see women, mount poopy to come and sing. And what he's thinking is, ah! if I catch this one. And we are all seated, holy, holy holding Bible. You don't know what somebody will do tomorrow. That is why God told Samuel, I don't look the way man looks. Samuel will have anointed Eliab. A prophet like Samuel he said, Surely, surely, sure, oh, sure, pa, sure, sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. That's why, how will you allow a prophet to be telling you to marry? Let God talk to you directly. The reason why you can't make a choice for yourself is because you don't know the heart of a man. That lady that you think is, is not good, you don't even know what her heart is. She may be the perfect one for you tomorrow. You don't know. 
That's why you must learn to trust God to make a choice. <laughs> it's not your choice. The disciples knew that even though he had been with Jesus from beginning to the day Jesus was taken to heaven, his heart may still not be right. At least they had the experience of Judas. Who started with them from the beginning. And he ended up tragedy, in tragedy. <laughs> Brethren, you need to pray. You see, when you understand this, your prayer will change. You will be scared of making choice. And you see, when I hear brothers just talking to sisters, like Parod, I love you. I want to go out with you. I want to be with you. I want to be. Do you see this one? I like you. I love you. Something is wrong. When you are too, too anxious to speak, something is wrong. When you are anxious to speak, you just think it's all about telling a lady that she's beautiful. You like her. You want to spend your life with her. Me, I want to spend my life with Jesus. You can then come if you want to also spend your life with Jesus. I don't want to spend my life with any woman. I want to spend my life with Jesus. If she also wants to spend her life with Jesus, then we can be in the same ship. But I'm not going to tell you that I want to spend the rest of my life with you. <laughs> I don't want to spend the rest of my life with you. And uh, There is no need flattering you. I want to spend it with Jesus. <laughs> that doesn't mean I won't love you. <laughs> They said, Lord, which knoweth the heart of all men, only God. Only God knows the heart of all men. So who are you to think that you can make your choice? You see someone on Facebook, you say, ah, you know, I just wish he's the one. <laughs> mm -hmm. You see, that's why you must allow people to speak. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. One of the checks you should actually do is to allow people to speak. When you are with a man, that when you ask him, so what is this? And see, I don't like being questioned. You know what many sister or lady will do? They stop asking questions. They are afraid of offending him. They don't want him to go. That's a weakness. That's how many men have tricked women to marry them. Because if she had continued with the probe, so many things would be revealed. So the man hides under the fact that I don't like talking, I don't like, and the lady too accept it. Mm. This one that I have, I better not lose this one. I don't know when another one will come. It is better to be single and happy than to be chopping woto woto in marriage. Is see, there are many married women, they are praying to be single. They wish they could go to their single. You that you are single, you don't you see, you don't know what you have. And I pray you won't lose what you have. That peace and joy. If you want to marry, let it be another step into peace and joy, not into crisis. I've seen people that they will not just be patient. Eventually they marry, then one month later, the whole thing scattered. Now you are married. If you remarry, it's adultery. One month, one month. Why can't you be patient? What are you running into? Marriage doesn't take people to heaven. What do you want to go and do there? So you don't know the heart of anybody. So except you want to play God. You see why you need prayer? You need prayer because you are making a decision that you don't have facts to make that decision. You don't know the heart of the, the person. Only the Lord knows. So they got to this junction, they say, Lord, these people have been with Jesus, so, uh, but we still don't know the heart. That tells you that it's not every Christian that you can marry. Some people will tell you that once he's a Christian, just go ahead and marry. All these people seeking for perfection. But who is asking for perfection? We are asking only what the Bible says we should follow. What perfection are we asking for? What perfection is there to say this person must be born again? 
Jesus said, by their fruit, you shall know them. There are basic requirements you should see in the life of a child of God. It is not perfection. That's what, in fact, it is, that is the perfection of God, not of man. So if the person doesn't meet that, why must you compromise? They intimidate you that you are looking for a perfect person. No, you are looking for what God says you should look for. Somebody says, sir, with all these things you are saying, is there anybody who is right? I said, that means you are not right. Because if you are right, you won't say, you should say, sir, I can see that I'm the only one who is right. And we can start from that place. But once you are saying, sir, nobody is like this, that means you yourself, you are not like this. And what are we saying? We said, don't marry a non-believer. Don't marry a baby in Christ. Don't marry a sinner. Don't marry a worldly man. Why should a Christian be worldly? Why should a Christian delight in sinning? What is, what, what stand we, this is just basic. Paul said, if you are going to appoint somebody as a bishop, he must be blameless. Now, he's not saying a bishop must be blameless. He said the person who qualifies to be a bishop. So he's not a bishop. He's just an ordinary brother in the church. And yet he's blameless. And then you are saying, eh, why are you asking for perfection? You know, they come with all kinds of things. You too, you now be feeling bad that ah, maybe you are taking this thing too far. Oh. Maybe this, not, this standard is, is too high. Oh. Let me reduce it. Let me reduce it. Some women, they even told them, it doesn't matter. Ah, most men, they fornicate. You will just marry and take your eyes off. They marry now, it has graduated to adultery. Anyway, so, hmm. verse 25. That he may take part of the ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lot, and the lot fed, fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with eleven. It is when God has now guided you that this is the right heart. Please be ready to cast your lot. And look at that word, their lot. Your life, what you are casting is your life. So don't cast your lot carelessly. When you cast your lot as a man, with a woman, it is for life. Oh. As a woman, if you cast your lot, <laughs> it is your lot. A lot of you, that's what you are casting. To a man, make sure you cast it correctly. But the good news is this. God is not a wicked God. He's a loving father. At the end of all of this process, they arrive at a person. So we are not teaching this to make life difficult, to make it impossible to marry. No. At the end of the day, did they not get the right person? You will get the right person. That's why we have studied all of this. God is committed more than you are interested in guiding you to the right person. And God we not send you this word today if he isn't committed to your life. The way he has spoken to us today, I perceive that God himself is committed to you getting it right. Not you getting it fast. Don't envy people who are getting married. Just focus on getting married right. You see, when Ahab, when they told Ahab that it was going to rain, he climbed his chariot and he went, he took off. Elijah had no chariot and had not started running. The Bible says, and the Holy Ghost came upon Elijah. And he ran and he overtook Ahab, who was on chariot. You see, we need somebody who can run with the Holy Ghost. You have not seen somebody who will run the 100 meters with the Holy Ghost. Somebody is going to come and beat Usain Bolt. Usain Bolt record. Mark my word. Somebody is going to come 
and beat Usain Bolt record. And that person will be a child of God. It will happen. The last time we spoke about the excellent life, making impact. So a man can run with the Holy Spirit. It means he can also do long jump with the Holy Spirit. He can do high jump with the Holy Spirit. We have not taken Christ to every facet of life. You can do everything through Christ. That's the season. How many things? I can do all things. I'm trusting God that he is going to raise sport men that are born again, spirit filled. And you will see. Thank God for the lady who ran our 110 meters and one gold. When they asked her, she said, it is God. And I sincerely want to believe it is God. She said something. She said, I never knew I was going that fast. Let me tell you, before most athletic championship, you will, know, you, will, you will have an idea of people who could break record. Nobody saw it in her. I saw some of her race where she was coming fifth, sixth. <laughs> but when I watched her in the semi-final, because I followed that athletic championship, when I saw her in the semi-final, I said to myself, it will take something special for anybody to beat this race. And you know that she's just a, an innocent young girl. Don't let me talk sport. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that when the Holy Spirit came on Elijah, he overtook Ahab. Don't worry about the person going fast. Be concerned with getting it right, not fast. When you get it right, it's a matter of time. Those who did it fast, they will soon be behind, even though we are not in competition with anybody. What you should be concerned with is getting it right. The apostles, they followed this principle and they got it right. You will also get it right. If you follow God's word, you will get it right. God wants you to get it right. God is committed to you getting it right. God, see, it is God that is at stake. It's not you. If I don't have marriage today, I can't preach some things. If I don't have a correct marriage, I can't preach some things. There are many people I can't reach. In fact, I really wouldn't have anything to say. You know, the Bible says something. Say, if a man cannot rule his own house, how shall he rule the house of God? One of the ways to know a genuine man of God is that his marriage will be correct. I heard of a man of God who, who is going about also seeking counsel and they will be telling him that his wife is a witch. And, he too will come, and, and this is a man that is doing crusade. And then they will still tell him that his wife is a witch and he will still be having issues with his wife. I said, you should just quit all this crusade. Go and sit down at home and mend ways with his wife. If a man cannot rule the house of God, because what exactly is the gospel? The gospel is that we have received the life of Jesus. And this life, we want to show it to the world. So how can that life not function in a home with one woman? And then you now put that life on pulpit to give to people. You can't love one woman. You can't relate with one woman with the life of Christ. But you want to relate with a big congregation with the life of Christ. You are doing empty activity. That's why Jesus said, many will say to me on that day. Did we not do this? But I will profess to them, I never knew you. Empty activities. What you must let, so if you don't get marriage right, even God can't use you for certain things. He can't. So it is God that is at stake. See, your life is not about, if you understand Christianity, your life is not about you. The day you said you give your life to Jesus, look at that word. I gave my life to Christ. If you gave it to him, why are you still in charge? He said, I gave my life to him. It's no longer about you. As a woman, God is not looking at you getting married. God is a strategic God. He's planning. He said, okay, I have my son, dear. I'm, I'm planning Sister BC. I'm raising her. I'm making her, I'm shaping her so that she's going to fit into Brother John and that my purpose will prosper in their life. That's the plan of God. 
A man called me from Australia this week. He said, sir, pray for me. He's a man of God. He has ministry in Australia. He said, but you see, the enemy has come against me through my wife. He said, my wife is not doing what we came to do here. She's pursuing something else. God called them to Australia. The wife has seen a fantastic country. She wants to make money. That's why I said, we came here to do something new. Just this week. If your marriage is not right, it is going to affect what God can do with your life. So it is God that is at stake. It is not you. <laughs> God, God cannot afford for you to fail. So if you fail, it means that you've really, 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 really struggled against God to fail. Because he himself does not want you to fail. He wants you all to marry right. God is going to send you your spouse. Your Matthias will come. But he wants you to understand that it is for him. It is not for you. So don't get into marriage. You see, let me begin to warn you because I believe that what God has said will come to pass. Don't get into marriage and live for yourself. And say to there that now it is time for enjoyment. Many couples don't review their marriage and say, how is this marriage fulfilling God's plan? They are just giving birth. Oh, Monisha, they are just giving birth. How they are going to just enjoy a couple, couple, oh, we are a couple, husband and wife, we are a couple. What is God reaping? He said, Jesus said, a man planted a vineyard, put husband men, and traveled to a far country. Traveled to a far country. Then later, he sent his servant to harvest fruit. When he plants a vineyard, he's expecting something. So when God gives you marriage, he's expecting something from it. It's not you. So if your marriage is producing nothing for God, it is useless to God. He's, you are just having a social contract. So what did we learn today in summary? One, it started with scriptures. You must be a man and woman of scriptures. Give, your, give attention to the word of God. All that we have said today, we simply read the Bible. Two, they narrowed down their search to somebody who had been with Jesus. Jesus is what you are looking for. You are not looking for a tall, handsome guy. You are not looking for a robust woman. Short and portable. That's not what you are looking for. You are looking for Christ in a person. Then the Bible says they prayed. So there is a place for prayer. And then they cast their lot. Sister, cast your lot. To, if you are sure, they say yes. Don't, don't be saying, eh, I'm still praying about it. Don't play how to get. How to get does not earn you respect and love. Jesus has secured your love in the heart of men. He says, husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church. That's an instruction to a man that has nothing to do with your own performance. So don't think that when you play hard to get, he will respect you. If you are sure, even day one, say yes. <laughs> and let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Don't say no and, and mean yes. Don't say, well, let me tell him no now so that he can keep pursuing me. We don't do that in the kingdom. We are children of light, not darkness. Let us pray. I'm sure now you will have an idea of how to now pray. I don't know the state that you are. Is it that you have not found your own justice and Matthias? So your own prayer is that, Lord, bring me in contact with my justice and Matthias. You know, we are using this as a parable. Is it that you have found them, but you don't really know, you are confused? Ask the Lord to give you light. To guide you to choose right. And then I want you to pray and say, God, let my marriage fulfill your purpose. Give me a marriage that will bring about your kingdom on earth. A marriage that you can stand as a platform to extend your will. Let's thank him for his mercy and the way he has spoken to us. I want you to thank him sincerely. I'm not just saying let's thank him just as a routine. Thank him. Because see, uh, 
wedding bell will ring for some of you now. God will move you from that next stage that you should be. He will move you there. I've not come to psych you. I'm telling you what God is about to do. Thank him sincerely. Thank him. Thank him for what he's about to do in your life. Thank him because he is committed. That's why I sent for this word to you. I've not come to preach because I'm intelligent. He sent me to bring a word to you. He won't send me if he didn't mean to, to lead you to that Matthias. He's committed to it. Thank him sincerely as we round up our prayers. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. God bless you.